Everybody is looking for that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. The irresistible gleam of those precious golden nuggets is blinding. Just ask the greedy investors who poured billions of dollars into Briex Minerals Limited in the 90s in the hopes of getting a piece of the literal gold mine the company discovered deep in the jungles of Indonesia. With that unmistakable golden allure on their minds, these investors failed to do their homework on Briex and the gold they supposedly struck. Little did they know, the gold mine was a giant hoax. What exactly happened to Michael de Guzman, the mastermind who vanished into thin air? Before we tackle the lingering questions surrounding de Guzman's mysterious death in 1997, let's jump back to the beginning of this crazy story. Briex Minerals Limited was initially founded by a Canadian named David Walsh in the late 1980s. Walsh started the Calgary-based mining company in the hopes of breaking into the diamond expedition game. This proved more difficult than Walsh anticipated, and he was forced to file for personal bankruptcy in 1991 after several failed Briex expeditions. He shifted the focus of his business from diamonds to gold. To do that, he partnered with famed geologist John Fettelhoff, who had previously made a name for himself by heading up an expedition in Papua New Guinea, uncovering the region's largest known gold mine. Felderhoff brought the necessary mining experience to legitimize Briex's new operations. Walsh set his sights on the jungles of Indonesia in Briex's search for gold, and Felderhoff officially became the general manager of the company's Indonesian expedition. The team was coming together, but there was one major player yet to be recruited. His name was Michael de Guzman, a Filipino geologist who had been a longtime friend and colleague of Felderhoff. With the combined expertise of the two geologists he brought on board, Walsh had everything he needed. Well, everything except the gold. Felderhoff and de Guzman eyed an area of the Indonesian jungle that sat close to the Busang River in Kalimantan, a province on the island of Borneo. Their interest in this area seemed more than a little curious, given the fact that the site they were looking at had been deemed worthless by not one, not two, but 12 other mining companies. Even so, Felderhoff and de Guzman insisted that they believed the site would yield golden results for Briex. With their expert advice in tow, Walsh and company set up shop on the so-called worthless land in 1993. De Guzman was named the site's project manager, and their gold mining efforts finally began. This wasn't the first time Felderhoff and de Guzman had worked together on a mining expedition, and it wasn't the first time they mined in Busang either. The pair had previously collaborated on a Busang exploration just a few years before being hired by Walsh, which is why they pointed Walsh and Briex in that direction in the first place. De Guzman had struggled to break into the geology field for many years before his association with Briex Minerals. A high school basketball star in the Philippines, his hoop dreams were unfortunately shattered, along with his knee, before he could ever make it as an athlete. Nevertheless, De Guzman didn't let the devastating incident take away his enthusiasm for life. De Guzman sought a career as a geologist following the demise of his playing days. Although he was not going to be the basketball star he once hoped to be, he chased after fame and fortune all the same. His geological exploits brought him all across Southeast Asia to various mining outposts where he sought that ever-elusive gold like so many before him. Much of his career was filled with failed expeditions, many of which came alongside his good buddy John Felderhoff. Together, they climbed volcanoes, walked along earthquake fault lines, and descended into the earth, searching for the golden treasure that would make their hard work worth it. Though Felderhoff had tasted success before, de Guzman was still hunting his first victory. One way or another, he was going to make it happen. That hunger for his first discovery was what made him so eager to join Briex's expedition in Indonesia. It presented the perfect opportunity for him to test a theory he'd been cooking up for years. That theory was called Volcanic Pool Theory, and it's why Felderhoff and de Guzman were so optimistic that they'd find gold in Busang. We won't bore you with the scientific details of de Guzman's theory. In the simplest terms, the volcanic pool theory states that when a volcano collapses into itself, the combination of pressure and high temperatures makes gold. His life's work as a geologist led to the creation of this theory, and the Briex job was de Guzman's last chance at redeeming his otherwise mediocre career. The theory seemed to check out in the eyes of Felderhoff and Walsh, and they used it to select the site on which Briex could conduct its mining operations. Because Busang is positioned close to several volcanoes, it was the perfect spot for de Guzman to test out the volcanic pool theory, finally find the gold he had spent his life searching for. 
Felderhoff and Guzman were going against the grain with their Briex expedition in Busang, and much of their operations were rather unorthodox. They were mining in a place that a dozen previous explorations had already concluded to be empty, and their process for analyzing core samples from the Busang site was different from standard practices that had been followed for years. It looked like they had no clue what they were doing to the outside world, and for two years, it seemed like they didn't. They failed to discover any gold on the Busang land. Time was officially running out on De Guzman and his volcanic pool theory. Even Felderhoff had reached the breaking point, and he advised Briex to shut down operations on the property in 1995. De Guzman's window of opportunity was all but closed. Just as the Briex expedition was nearing its end, they finally struck gold. Literally. In 1995, De Guzman reported to Walsh that they found gold on the very land they'd been examining for two years. De Guzman's initial estimate predicted 2 million ounces of gold on the property. As the Briex crew continued to survey the scope of their discovery, that estimate grew to 30 million ounces. For the next two years, they continued to find more and more gold scattered across the Busang site, and the final estimate gave in 1997 totaled 71 million ounces of gold. That's a lot of buried treasure, and it must have been buried pretty deep for it to go completely unnoticed, only to be found at the very last moment before the operation was to be shut down. It almost seems a little too good to be true, huh? Investors certainly didn't think so. As Briex's gold finding soared, so did their stock. News of their historic discovery spread worldwide. The Canadian mining company saw immediate gains in the market. Prospective investors did everything they could to get a piece of the growing Briex pie. They bent over backward to invest in a business endorsed by trusted financial advisors like JP Morgan and Lehman Brothers, who called Briex's expedition the gold discovery of the century. Their stock price experienced astronomical growth, ballooning from $0.30 cents a share to a whopping $170 a share. Everyone that bought into Briex had that golden twinkle in their eye. They were intoxicated by the boulders of gold unearthed in Indonesia, making any red flag regarding the whole operation completely irrelevant. Investors weren't the only ones desperate to get in on the action either. The Indonesian government stepped in after catching wind of Briex's remarkable discovery. President Sanharto had no clue that his country was home to a gold mine of such massive size, but he would make sure that they saw their fair share of the profits. The gold did sit within their borders, after all. They entered negotiations with Briex, and the resulting deal divvied up ownership of the land between Briex, the Indonesian government, and a larger American mining company called Freeport McMoran, which was tasked with aiding Briex's mining efforts. Briex still owned 45% of the land, which was the largest percentage between the three partners, but this new deal opened up the opportunity for an outside party to come in and inspect the land themselves. Once that happened, things started to unravel quickly for de Guzman and company. After testing their portion of the Busang land, Freeport McMoran realized that there wasn't even an ounce of gold on the property. They were obviously suspicious of their findings, and they immediately scheduled a meeting with de Guzman to clear things up. That meeting never happened. De Guzman hopped on board a helicopter that was supposed to take him to his fateful meeting with Freeport McMoran. Before it ever arrived, however, he jumped out, plummeting to his death. What led to such a dramatic turn of events? Well, as it turns out, the entire Briex gold discovery had been a scam, masterminded by de Guzman himself. The 12 previous mining expeditions were correct in their findings. There was no gold reserve hidden in the jungles of Butsang. De Guzman had planted all of the gold that was found and reported by Briex through a process known as salting. De Guzman had gotten his hands on a large amount of gold jewelry, some of which he pawned off local villagers. He then shaved little bits of gold from the pieces of jewelry, scattering them all over the land that was subsequently sampled and tested by Briex. This is called salting and ultimately accounted for all the gold found on the Busang property. When the expedition was mere weeks from being shut down in 1995, de Guzman had nowhere else to turn. He knew the failure to uncover even an ounce of gold would be an indictment on him and his unproven volcanic pool theory. In an act of desperation, he decided his best option was to create a fake gold mine. For a while it worked. He had surrounded himself with a crew of inexperienced workers that did not have the knowledge or expertise to second guess the questionable practices and procedures de Guzman used during the expedition. Many of the geologists on staff were recent college graduates out in the field for the first time. De Guzman took advantage of their ignorance and operated his scam unchecked by those around him. 
De Guzman did face some questions from curious investors who were unsure of his unorthodox tactics. He was able to quell their fears by emphasizing his own geological expertise, backed up by Felderhoff, who ensured worried investors De Guzman knew exactly what he was doing. Felderhoff's word was enough for investors that cared more about gold than due diligence. Of course, nobody had a clue that De Guzman was basically sneaking out in the middle of the night and planting gold on the property. Once Briex entered their partnership with the Indonesian government, the jig was up. De Guzman knew his crimes would be discovered in short order, and everything he had worked for would vanish all at once. His failure proved too burdensome, and he took the plunge off that helicopter, crashing down to the jungle below, allegedly. That's the official story anyway. But did De Guzman fake his own death? Is it possible that he's still alive to this day? Many believe that to be true, and that conspiracy is not entirely without evidence. Workers on the Briex site have said that they saw de Guzman pack up duffel bags filled with hundreds of thousands or perhaps even millions of dollars in cash on the day that he supposedly died. That's an interesting thing to do if you're planning on jumping out of a helicopter. But what if you're planning on faking your death and disappearing to South America? Some believe that was de Guzman's plan all along. That much cash would have helped him start over in a new country and never work a day again in his life. That's not just crazy conspiracy theorists with tinfoil hats that think de Guzman is still alive either. The doctor that performed his autopsy had gone on record saying he doesn't think the body he examined was de Guzman's. By the time the body was found in the Busang jungle, it had decomposed beyond recognition. On top of that, a body had gone missing from a nearby morgue not long before de Guzman's apparent suicide. Could this be the body they ultimately found? Who knows? But the Guzman's wife poured gasoline on the conspiracy's fire when she came out and said that she received a mysterious payment of $25,000 from someone in Brazil after her husband's death. Perhaps it's likely that de Guzman committed suicide just in the manner the history books say. But maybe he didn't. Maybe he's alive right now, living a lavish life somewhere in South America with the millions he scammed off eager Briex investors, having attained the fame and fortune he always dreamed of. Whatever you believe about de Guzman's current whereabouts, he was entirely out of the picture after his apparent suicide. The rest of the Briex crew was left to pick up after his mess. Although no link was ever officially drawn between de Guzman's scam and his Briex companions, Felderhoff and Walsh, there was plenty of suspicion surrounding the pair of surviving Briex executives after the Busang fraud was exposed. Once Freeport McMoran discovered the lack of gold in the property, Felderhoff and Walsh sold $25 million of Briex stock immediately. Not exactly something you do when everything's going smoothly. The Securities and Exchange Commission found their sudden move to cash in more than a little suspicious given the fact that it occurred right before de Guzman's death and the uncovering of his scam. Still, nothing could be proven, and the two got away scot-free of any charges. They didn't exactly ride peacefully into the sunset, though. Walsh moved to Nassau after the dust finally settled on the whole incident and ended up being accosted by two masked gunmen who broke into his house and demanded he hand over all of his money. While he didn't meet his end that night, he died just a few weeks later of a brain aneurysm. Felderhoff had his fair share of troubles, too. He was charged with insider trading by the Ontario Securities Commission in 1999. He ended up receiving a verdict of not guilty, but that was after a long and arduous trial that did not conclude until 2007. He lived out the remainder of his life in the Philippines before passing away in 2019. The whole charade led to several systematic changes in Canada. Professional geology became more heavily regulated due to the Briex scam, and the Securities Commission put new legislation in place that required mining companies to accurately disclose their findings to potential investors and implemented the involvement of a qualified third party to keep miners in check. None of these changes helped the investors who dumped more than $6 billion into Briex recoup any of their losses. Everybody involved in this whole situation came out a loser. The investors lost their money, Walsh lost his reputation and then his life shortly after, Felderhoff never regained his professional footing and was in and out of courtrooms for years. Then there's de Guzman. Supposedly, he too lost everything, or that's what they say. But maybe, just maybe, Michael de Guzman is the only winner in the entire Briex scandal. Perhaps he's sitting on a beach in South America, living the life he always dreamed of, all thanks to the gold mine that never existed. Click to watch one of these next videos.